Thank you, John. Maybe a little bit of Han Solo mixed in, huh? Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, amazing range of topics here that AR is uh, um, intersecting with. And I hope I can uh, um, uh, add a little bit uh, uh, to the discussion uh, with uh, um, uh, a presentation on simulating the future of AR, which so many of us are, are doing. Um, so I co-direct uh, uh, what is known as the 4Eyes Lab uh, at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, the 4Eyes stand for Imaging, Interaction, and Innovative Interfaces. But I want to start with a nod to uh, uh, Steve um, uh, because it was uh, an absolute privilege for me to uh, um, uh, join his group in the mid-1990s uh, uh, and be part of a team uh, that uh, um, uh, was working on uh, the first outdoor mobile augmented reality system. And so we did... Uh, uh, something like this. Uh, uh, the building that you see there is uh, what covered Columbia's grounds uh, um, before Columbia moved there, and fittingly, it is the Bloomingdale Asylum for the Insane, um, which ca causes people to say that things do not change in history. Uh, and um, uh, this is what we looked like uh, um, in, uh, uh, in 1997, 1998 in, uh, in this case. Um, and uh, yeah, people were calling out Ghostbusters after us. <laughs> and come to think of it, uh, um, backpacks for uh, uh, augmented reality uh, or virtual reality and Ghostbusters sounds very much like 2016. So uh, um, uh, maybe just a glitch in the matrix. Uh, we fast forward to, uh, or back from 2016 to uh, 2007. Um, uh, I had started at uh, um, UC Santa Barbara in 2003, and uh, uh, in 2007, uh, one of our projects was uh, very much against all this equipment. Uh, we used computer vision to uh, um, uh, bootstrap and uh, uh, to track uh, an admittedly fairly small space. Uh, so we used uh, uh, the outstretched hand as a, a marker and uh, um, interface uh, um, element to, uh, to, to grab virtual objects and populate uh, a virtual desktop that kind of uh, uh, made your physical desktop uh, a little bit more interesting. And uh, um, so this is part of the, uh, the, the journey of, uh, of, of going on and simulating AR because uh, AR in its perfection is uh, not attainable and will not be maybe ever um, it depends on your definition of, uh, of perfection. In, in our case, uh, uh, around that time, this, this was the, the limited workspace uh, um, that, that was covered, just a, a desktop, and there was a, a SLAM system that uh, actually could uh, uh, build this model about this fairly small space uh, over time. Um, but uh, um, uh, it had its, its, its definite constraints. So uh, uh, in 2012, then, uh, um, we went uh, outdoors trying to like, uh, uh, cut a few more tethers and uh, um, getting a little bit wider in the area. Uh, and there you have the Star Trek uh, uh, reference. Uh, I don't think that uh, John knew that. Uh, uh, we, we would actually bring some, some content in, in here. Um, so. Uh, uh, this is not a SLAM system in 2012. My uh, uh, PhD student, John Ventura, uh, here in, in the picture, uh, actually uh, um, came up with a very clever, very uh, quick way of uh, uh, building a, uh, uh, a point cloud of, of any large-scale outdoor environment by just walking through it with a uh, omnidirectional camera and then using the structure from motion uh, uh, data cloud that you got uh, from that. Uh, to track against from uh, just an iPad. So a 2012 iPad in this case. And uh, uh, so that worked fairly well, as long as you have nice facades to look at uh, uh, and not uh, empty space or, uh, um, uh, or wavy shrubbery or uh, whatever uh, uh, other things could, could get this, uh, this tracking system to fail. And uh, so this is, this is just another example of, uh, of the, the shifting boundaries. Uh, um, we have better systems now. And HoloLens is uh, um, uh, uh, clearly currently commercially, um, in terms of commercially available uh, uh, systems, one of the most impressive uh, uh, standalone tracking systems. So last year, 
Uh, we did this with a, a, a HoloLens. Uh, we uh, uh, annotated uh, objects from afar with uh, simple gestures. And then, uh, so if you, courtesy of uh, the, the mapping that the, the HoloLens does, so the object uh, uh, is actually has a representation in, in polygons. And so from a distance, you can actually uh, place annotations that live exactly at the object. And so uh, we built a few gesture recognition uh, systems in there so that you could uh, uh, have some, some gestures to annotate the space. But as we all uh, um, know, who uh, have used the HoloLens, uh, uh, also that is not perfect. Uh, um, so I'll borrow an example from uh, our book. Dieter Schmarschlig and I uh, finished a book last year uh, uh, on augmented reality principles and practice. Um, and just to show uh, uh, what could happen in a scenario like this, uh, um, where you would want uh, uh, augmented reality in a, a sur surgery uh, situation, um, if you have a, uh, um, a system that uh, um, doesn't augment your entire field of view, you would get uh, something like this, where the, the overlay field of view is actually fairly small. And it happens to be fairly small for the HoloLens at the moment. So the quest continues with, uh, um, like, uh, basically, there's another step in just simulating the perfect AR. And wouldn't it be nice if we could really simulate um, an infinite field of view, or the human uh, uh, field of view, for augmented reality. And uh, uh, so since uh, uh, about 2009, this is something that uh, uh, we thought about a little bit more um, organized, in an organized fashion uh, in my lab. Um, uh, so this is work with, uh, with Doug Bowman from uh, Virginia Tech as well. And we... Uh, um, uh, use a system, virtual reality system, uh, uh, which currently uh, is, uh, is, fairly, uh, is uh, uh, fairly advanced, uh, uh, the virtual reality systems in terms of immersion. Um, so, so their uh, realism rises faster at the moment uh, uh, than, uh, than, than uh, augmented reality uh, um, in terms of different immersion factors like field of view, resolution, uh, um, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and if you have a high immersion virtual reality system, uh, which uh, uh, could be a head-worn system, or it could be a, a, a cave-like system. Uh, at uh, um, UC Santa Barbara, we have uh, a large-scale uh, immersive uh, spherical uh, system, the allosphere, which I will mention and show you in a, in a few minutes. Um, if you have such a high fidelity uh, uh, virtual reality system, you can actually simulate uh, other systems in the mixed reality spectrum uh, of a, a lower fidelity. And of course, the immersion uh, uh, axis is not one single axis. It would actually be split up in many, many dimensions. But uh, um, I, I think the, uh, the, the picture gives the overview. Um, so what do, do I mean by, uh, by simulating uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality? Well. Um, so uh, we, we ran a few validation studies. So, so as a famous, one of the famous uh, uh, early experiments in AR by uh, Steve Ellis, um, uh, where uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a Taurus uh, was uh, uh, kind of guided uh, uh, over a virtual wire uh, in a real space. And uh, so this is what it would look like to, to simulate that, a little bit clumsily, admittedly, uh, in virtual reality. And uh, by doing so and getting the same result for that study, we have one data point that says uh, um, doing this is actually worthwhile. Because if it were worthwhile for a large area of uh, um, applications, then you could actually now run controlled user studies of uh, very new and uh, otherwise uh, uh, not possible uh, AR uh, uh, research questions. And uh, um, so we ran a few more uh, uh, validation uh, and immersion studies uh, on this concept. This one here uh, deals with um, uh, trying to assess the impact of uh, the uh, fidelity of the real world backdrop. So in the simulated augmented reality, you need a representation of the real world. And you do this in virtual reality. So it doesn't make a difference if this real world is actually uh, uh, fairly realistic um, across many uh, uh, dimensions uh, in terms of polygon count, lighting, uh, texture, 
and so on and so forth. A and so we built a uh, um, different um, accuracy, different realism models of the same physical scene as you can see here, and then ran a user study with a, a particular test in augmented reality, both in the real world and then in virtual reality in this different fidelity uh, uh, environments. And the outcome was that uh, um, the main results, again, st uh, stayed stable. Um, there were some differences, and especially some differences, and this is why I put the picture up here in the bottom, um, and that deal with uh, uh, like high dynamic range lighting, for example, that is very hard to, uh, um, uh, to, to replicate in, in the virtual reality system that we used for this, with, uh, uh, which was for this very study a, a, a head one display. And before head one displays became a little bit better. Um, so, uh, uh, but in general, uh, it, uh, it gave us confidence that uh, the approach actually is interesting and very worthwhile. Um, so, instead of a, a head one display, you can, uh, you can actually uh, uh, run such studies also in an immersive surround view display. This is the allosphere. So, uh, um, this is a, a three story high spherical display about uh, 10, 11 meters in diameter. It's not exactly spherical, it's two hemispheres pushed apart so that you don't have an acoustic sweet spot in the middle. Um, but a bridge goes right through it. It's a little bit like Cerebro. Um, uh, the, the brain interfaces come later. Um, and uh, uh, you, uh, you basically can experience full surround uh, visual and audio. The audio is actually a very important part of this. Uh, um, uh, the the uh, instrument was uh, built by Jan Kochera Morin, uh, a, a, a um, composer and uh, uh, digital audio uh, researcher. And so in this uh, um, environment, we can now like, have our backdrop of reality. So this is just one of uh, my applications for this space, uh, which I, I love a lot. And so in this case, we are simulating uh, augmented reality on magic lenses, uh, smartphone form factors. And instead of using the camera on the back of the smartphone, we're actually streaming the portion of the tracked uh, this, uh, phone display, the portion that it looks at. And we can now, under full control, change the, uh, uh, the field of view, for example, change the latency of the annotations, um, uh, change uh, uh, the, the resolution and the uh, uh, reproduction quality uh, uh, on the phone, and so on and so forth. There's lots of immersion parameter, per parameters under our full control, and we can run uh, scientific studies in it. So here, just to see uh, uh, changing the field of view, virtual field of view, and uh, um, uh, it, it still behaves as if it were a, uh, um, a physical magic lens, but we, had, we have much more flexibility for actually playing around with it. And so um, uh, we can do studies with uh, uh, like uh, uh, fire emergency scenarios in the allosphere, smoke and 3D uh, uh, actually surrounds you. Um, but here's a, a, a last application I want to show you because uh, it actually was um, uh, a new experience for me. So we wanted to use the setup not for handheld AR, but for head-worn AR, and really get the experience of a wide field of view, ideally a um, human field of view, augmented reality. And uh, um, designers are currently not thinking about that because that is not currently possible with any device. Uh, uh, we are focusing on uh, specific point-based annotations, but uh, uh, wouldn't it be great if we had uh, uh, augmented material in our entire field of uh, vision? And uh, so the example that we came up with uh, uh, to, to test uh, this experience uh, was a, uh, a tourism application uh, or a um, uh, archaeological or art history application. Uh, we had uh, access uh, uh, through Tom DeFanti uh, uh, to this great, uh, beautiful panorama stereo panorama of uh, the Luxor Temple in Egypt. Uh, and uh, uh, so we used that as our representation as reality of reality, and then layered on top of it various uh, pieces of information that uh, uh, annotate the physical statues and uh, uh, art history in, in the space um, with various elements that uh, were like just strewn uh, across the uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the sky and the, uh, um, the, the panoramic backdrop. And then we connected these elements, uh, physical with the virtual, with uh, these leader lines, uh, and uh, had tasks in there uh, for quantitative timing and so on uh, to, uh, to actually have people follow them and answer questions about the space. So and this looks like this. And uh, so this whole setup lets you experience in simulation uh, a wide field of view augmented reality. And it was really a new experience, as I said, uh, uh, for me. Um, so here's uh, uh, how we set up the space. Um, so I, I may have to go in here and, uh, whoops, and uh, um, I don't know how to do that. Uh, go in there and, and fast forward a little bit. Yeah, about there maybe, yeah, perfect. So when you look around, uh, as you see the glasses are tracked, and uh, um, uh, we, we can simulate tracking artifacts, and then we can simulate uh, smaller field of views. So this is uh, showing um, uh, just in the portion uh, uh, where I'm currently looking, I see uh, um, the, the content of the augmentation, and uh, um, the wider field of view is actually uh, uh, empty, right? Because uh, again, I'm simulating a head-one display, but everything is projected onto uh, the panoramic backdrop of this uh, large-scale display. And so with this, uh, we can uh, uh, run studies and figure out uh, what field of view actually lets people uh, um, perform best in the task of uh, uh, finding my information in such a space. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, you need at least uh, um, kind of uh, uh, 60 to 80 uh, degrees uh, in, in, in order to, uh, um, to not have a big drop off in performance. And uh, um, uh, I invite people to come and uh, experience this because even wider field of views uh, uh, are actually uh, um, something that, that we're not uh, commonly think about. So down the road, uh, we run uh, um, many controlled studies of the on the influence of a variety of uh, immersion factors. Uh, la latency, field of regard, which you see in an uh, example here on the right, uh, um, slightly different from field of view, uh, uh, scene realism. Um, many compromises uh, uh, are still being struck with our simulation environment. It's not reality, uh, um, uh, and uh, the, the search gas, uh, the does go on. Uh, but I'm specifically interested in this question of a wide field of view. Uh, if an architect is standing in front of a uh, building in the space that uh, it will be uh, uh, um, constructed, then they should see in the entire field of view the, the, the building uh, uh, filling and, and, and coming up in front of them. Uh, right? And they should even be able to step inside of the building and actually look out the window and see the physical reality through the window. But if they're inside, they see uh, all the details of that architectural design. So it's a mixture of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And uh, in fact, I would say in the limit, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality do converge. Uh, I mean, in the latest time uh, when, uh, when we have real-time realistic scene reconstruction and rendering of the world in front of us uh, and, uh, uh, and can use that to, uh, to create new experiences. And uh, that would really reap the benefit of both. Um, and with that, uh, I uh, uh, thank the, uh, the researchers that uh, actually did this work uh, uh, in my lab uh, and our sponsors. Thank you very much. <laughs>